idea how what you just said, Brother Kurt, plays into today. I mean, uh, you'll, you'll keep that in mind as we arrive at the end of this sermon today, how blessed we are in this country. Uh, just to even have a copy of the Bible. Um, it's unbelievable and unfathomable, and we do forget and neglect how blessed we are. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, and turn with me to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 10. And when you find your place in verse 1, we will be reading this morning verses 1 through 18 together. Stand with me when you find your place. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to, ste to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, Seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hiring, hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also must I, I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father." And he that has ears to ear, hear, let him hear. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father God, this is your truth. This is your holy word. We trust now, Lord, that you will send your spirit to accompany what you have written. Lord, we long to see you today we want you to fill our hearts lord we want you to change us we cry out to you that you would etch these truths upon our hearts and minds that you may be glorified and honored in everything that is said and done here today we love you lord jesus and we need you in a very desperate way this hour father i pray that you would guide my mouth that you would remove any pride that is behind this pulpit, any pride that is in this room. I pray that you would lay bare hearts in this place, that your seed would be planted. We only pray through your Son and his magnificent name. Amen. We have arrived this morning to what I find to be the very heart and epicenter of John's gospel. This marvelous series of verses have brought great peace and comfort to the child of God. Not only now, 
but throughout the ages. At face value, we see here intimacy. We see peace, provision. We see protection. We see propitiation. As Christians, we find comfort in these gorgeous, this gorgeous picture that Jesus has just painted in these verses. We love this story. But is it only a story? Is this all that Jesus is telling us is just a story to make us feel good? Or is he laying forth a deeper truth? Is there more to it? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but as Christians, when we hear the words, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. When a Christian hears those words, it does something in here. There's a supernatural element to hearing Jesus say to us, I am the good shepherd. And not only that, I giveth my life for the sheep. There's something supernatural here. This is the supernatural call of the Spirit of God. And it's only there for Christ's sheep. It is openly, visibly infused with this supernatural calling. His sheep hear this and we say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for these words. Thank you for knowing what is going on in my life. Thank you for knowing the very corners of my heart that I have hidden so much from you in the world. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. Thank you for being my shepherd. Thank you for leading me. These words make our hearts point upward to the heavenlies. These words are, in fact, what we've just read. The very words, the voice of God. Your God just said to you, I am the good shepherd. Doesn't that make you swell with joy? And not only that, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. I need this good shepherd. I need this good shepherd. You need this good shepherd. We need this good shepherd. If we're going to be anything, we need this shepherd to lead us. When we read these words of Jesus, I am the good shepherd, we literally are hearing his voice. But some of us, some of us, even in this room, the Bible's clear. Not all are his sheep. Some of us will only hear with our ears and not with our hearts. People in the world will only hear this with their ears. They will not hear this with their hearts. But this is his voice. The whole world does not hear this voice. We long to hear our Savior calling, comforting, leading, loving. We long for it. Allow me to say that this passage of Scripture holds the entire, this passage of Scripture holds the entire reason for human existence. I'll even take it a step further is that if you only had John chapter 10, you could build a church. You could go take John 10 and you could plant a church with just this chapter. That's how deep and rich this is. Mind you, in China right now, they only have sections of this gospel. And the church is taking root like wildfire. And they only have pieces of this. We've got the whole thing here in America, and the church is dying. Just like what Brother Kurt said, we don't realize how blessed we actually are to have some homes. Statistically speaking, most homes in the United States have anywhere between four and five Bibles. And at the end of this message, you're going to see something 
that I hope pricks your heart about what God is doing in China through his voice. Through his voice. God's plan, God's purposes, God's design for time, the tick of the clock, God's providence in your life, the reason for joy, the reason for trials, the reason for death, the reason for life, it is all made clear in this passage. And you may have thought to yourself this morning as we were reading this passage, ah, this is the Good Shepherd story. Dear ones, this is so much more than just the Good Shepherd story. So much deeper. Jesus goes so deep here. He does this on purpose. He challenges us in speaking this way. In telling this story, Jesus is challenging us. He uses these figures of speech that some would understand and that others wouldn't. You may be thinking that's pretty straightforward here. You know, I, how can Jesus be teaching something that is so deep whenever this is just simply a story of him and the, being the good shepherd? He is the door and we are his sheep. How is there so much more here? Here and elsewhere in John and the Gospels and throughout the New Testament, Jesus has been teaching us the theology of himself. Jesus himself has been teaching us the theology of himself. And this passage is chock full of the power of the theology of Jesus. The power of Jesus is in John chapter 10. Why would Jesus teach so deeply to literally unbelievers and new Christians? Isn't that contrary to how we should teach the word of God today? I mean, don't go deep. They won't get it. You're just going to fly over their heads. Don't go so deep. Just give them the milk of the word. Today, I want to give you a juicy steak. And I want you to taste the meat of the word of God. I want you to have more than milk, as Paul says. I want you to, to be fed and nurtured on the meat of the word of God. I want you to be sustained from inside the depths of your soul by going deep into God's word, just as Jesus does here. And you're saying to yourself, wait a minute. I've heard this story since I was in Sunday school. How is there so much more here? We got to go deep. We, may, we need to sink our hands into this blessed word. We need to know what Jesus is telling us here about himself. Are we supposed to go deeply into God's word? Of our, we are supposed to go deeply into God's word and what the Savior says to find his richness in joy. So that we may find lasting joy, we aim to do what Jesus did. We aim to learn what he taught and make it, make it our life. We aim to apply it to our lives. This morning, I lay before something, I lay something before you this morning that I believe you may have never seen before in this passage. And if some of you have seen this, it may have made you angry. If what I'm going to show you this morning, if this steak that I'm going to show you, this, this beautiful piece of meat that I'm going to show you from God's word, if you've seen it before, it may have made you angry in the past. Not that I'm teaching some new thing as some new pastor. I'm saying, well, look, I'm laying before you something new. It's not something new. In fact, it is ancient. I do, however, hope that the word of God would offend you that you may be humbled and broken, that you may see the truth and the healing that is found therein in knowing the Good Shepherd. I'm going to set before you this morning an ancient truth. This truth has been swept under the rug uh, because it, is, it, is just, it causes too much unrest in the minds and hearts of so many. Uh, this truth is the nucleus of of the Christian life, the power behind the forgiveness of sins. Here we are brought face to face with the efficacy, that is the effectual power of the blood of the Lamb of God. In John 10, we are brought face to face with the power of the efficacy, that is the effectual working of the power of the blood of the Lamb. It's here in John 10. 
We, we, we are met with this great big word that we find in the book of Romans. It begins with a P. It's called propitiation. We're met here with that. He pays for the sins of his sheep. He propitiates. He appeases two parties. He propitiates. He atones for the sins of his sheep. He that has ears to hear his voice, let him hear. We place, we place too much emphasis today on the mystical attempts to hear God speak to us. When in fact the devil himself even tries to speak to us and, and he tries to misguide us. So you have this, this tug of war in Christians, and especially in the American church. We have this tug of war. We, we attempt to listen for the voice of God. And then all the while, this, the devil is trying to speak to us as well and misguide us. And we're trying to differentiate and discern what is the voice of God, what is his voice, and what is the voice of Satan. Isn't that a terrible place to be? To think, well, what, who was that? And how do I differentiate between that? There have been books written. You can, you can go on Amazon. I don't recommend this. Not right now. Do it later. No, don't even do it later. There are books on Amazon, and Amazon, and Amazon, Amazon called How to Hear God's Voice and Listening to God. So two books. They're written. These, are, these only succeed to misguide and lead astray, causing people to sit in a closet waiting to hear the voice of God in some new means of extra revelation. After being led astray and misguided by under-shepherds and money-making books such as, such as these, I'll even tag on to, and some of you won't like this, those books about people going to heaven and coming back, throw them in the trash. I have biblical grounds to make that remark. If those are at home on your bookshelf and you've read those and you have, you've enjoyed those, I recommend you take them and you put them in the garbage because the word of God does not give grounds for that. The apostle Paul, when he died, he literally died, was beaten, thrown down a cliff. He says, hey, it was 13 years ago. Uh, I really don't know if I was inside or outside of the body, but all I know is that the things I saw, there aren't words for it. And he left it at that. You don't need those. You need this. These, only, these books, they, they only succeed in misguiding and leading astray. And guys, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, the men that have written these books, I've listened to their sermons. I enjoy hearing them. I enjoy hearing their teaching. Their teaching has actually, not on this particular subject, has actually furthered my walk with Jesus. These are well-known, well-respected men writing these books. But I'm going to show you why they mislead and, and misguide and lead astray. And I want you to be discerning as you have these, these things. This is what the Christian ends up at, okay? And maybe you can even say, whoa, I've thought that. I've thought that in my own mind. That came across my own heart. Have you ever asked ask yourself this question? Okay, I've read these books. I'm listening for the voice of God. And here's the question. How do I know if God is actually speaking to me? How do I know if that was God? Was that God? Was that my conscience? Was that Satan? Every Christian that goes through this season where they're like listening for God's voice, they actually come to this point where they say, was that God? And then we're caught into this revolving door, like trying to figure out, was that the voice of God? Was that the voice of God? Was that the voice of God? And we're like on the hamster wheel. I'm going to clarify this for you this morning, okay? Pastor and teacher, Dr. Stephen J. Lawson, I, I have the utmost respect for this man. He rightly said, and I wholeheartedly agree, if you want to hear God speak to you, Read his word out loud. This will get you out of that revolving door, and this will actually get you back to where God is speaking to you, back to his voice. If you want to hear God speak, here it is. This will eliminate all the questioning and doubting in your mind. If you want to hear God speak, read his word. 
That is where God speaks to you. And just like what we've read in John chapter 10, verses 14, 11, 14, 16, Jesus, 1 through 18, Jesus is speaking to his sheep. This morning, may God, by his word, may the word of God speak to us by his Holy Spirit. This has been my earnest prayer for weeks, that we would find joy in his voice. And that's the title of this morning's message is His Voice. Throughout these 18 verses, we've read it many times. We've heard His voice, His voice, His voice. Look at verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the shepherd, into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep, he calleth them with his voice, his words, his tone, his, his word. He calleth his own sheep, what, just as a general call? Of course there's a general call of the gospel. There's a general call throughout the land, throughout the world. There's a general call. But this doesn't say that that is a general call. This says John. This says deacon. Patrick, Lynn, Jennifer, this is a direct call from God to say, I'm calling you, my sheep, come to me. This isn't, hey, I'm the shepherd, it's Jane, I am the shepherd. He calls his sheep by name, and then he leads them out. Verse 4, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. He goes before the sheep. The sheep follow their shepherd. For they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of the stranger. Okay, then we, we find out that in the very ver next verse, verse 6, it says, This parable spake Jesus unto them, but... They understood not what the things they were, not what the things they, they were which he spake unto them. He, they didn't get it. Now, this particular Greek word here for parable is not the same kind of word that was used in Matthew. For instance, Matthew 13, when he gives the parable of the soils, or whenever he gives the parable of the, uh, the uh, lost sheep. He, those are different parables. In this instance, this strictly means this is a figure of speech. He's, he's painting this picture. He's using this as a figure of speech, a metaphor, an allegory. He's painting this picture. This is a parable. That's point number one. The parable of the good shepherd. The parable of the door. This painting of a picture. Just to give you a little bit of a background, shepherding, shepherding a flock is literally the oldest profession in the world. Do you know how we know that? Because in Genesis chapter 3 and 4, we actually see that the, the sons of Adam... There was only one of them. One of them grew a good garden. Remember Cain? He loved growing a garden, fruits and vegetables. And he brought forth the garden, and he actually brought that as a sacrifice. And Cain, by his works, brought his garden forth and says, this is what I'm offering to God. I'm offering the fruit of my hands. I'm bringing you something that I planted, I made, I grew, I watered, and then here it is, God. But God did not have acceptance to that sacrifice because it was not a sacrifice. It was a works sacrifice base means of atonement but Abel on the other hand what did Abel bring Abel brought the first fruits of his flock Abel was a shepherd this is the oldest profession in human history it's still going on today shepherds are still in business today it was a lowly bill a lowly job a smelly job. I don't know if any of you have been around sheep. But sheep don't smell like, yeah, what's your car smell like right now, Sam? My car smells like lamb. <laughs> My car's, do you have a, a lamb candle? <laughs> sheep stink. They smell. And, and their excrement is particularly stinky. I can deal with cow manure, horse manure, but there's just something about sheep 
that really smells. And these guys are following and leading them all over the lands. At this particular time and today, shepherds are still a common job in much of the world. Much of the world, even in the United States, it's still a, a, a job that is well known throughout the world. Jesus, the words of Jesus are timeless. Even somebody that doesn't own any sheep can relate to this. Okay, one, my two-year-old daughter knows what a sheep is. She, she can make the sound. She knows what a sheep is. I mean, this is relatable to everyone throughout the ages. This parable, this figure of speech that he lays forth, he, he gives us many characters and elements. The first character is the door, to which Jesus says that he is the door. Now notice, this, this profession is well known throughout the world today. What would happen was these shepherds would bring their flocks into town. They would need a place for the, to stay for the night, and they would put them into a sheepfold, a pen, a corral, they would, a community pen. They would all go in there. They would all get mixed in. They would mingle around each other. Some would be black. Some would be white. Some would have black faces, white feet, black feet. They were all mingled there together, and the shepherds would then stay near the pen. This was at night. It helped, it helped to protect from predators. It helped to keep robbers condensed. They would have to climb up, just as Jesus said, climb up over the wall and get into the sheep fold because they surely weren't bringing the sheep out the front door. There was only one entrance. The rest of the pen was corralled. And Jesus says, I'm the door. He makes this metaphor. He says, I'm the door. Literally, I am the one that you either come to God through me or you don't. And notice what else he says. And I love this. If this doesn't get your blood pumping this morning, this should really get you fired up for the power of your Savior. He says, I'm the door. He offers the gospel call. Yes, if you want to come to God, you must come through the door. You have to come through Jesus. But once you're on the other side, you know what he says to those on the outside? If you want to get to these sheep, you've got to come through me. And I'll tell you right now, there isn't a one that can get through that door trying to come after his sheep. Do you see the peace and the power and protection when Jesus says, I'm going to lay here at the door, and if you want to come and get my sheep, you've got to come through me. <laughs> Do you feel protected by your Savior? Your King of kings and Lord of lords who stands with a sword drawn in his hands and says, bring it on. You can't take me down to get to Tammy. To Carla. You got to come through me. I love that. Does that not give you assurance of salvation? You've came through the door. You've came. You've gone through the blood of the lamb. You've gone through Jesus Christ. You are in the fold, but it gets better. It gets so much better. You're still mixed in. You're just mixed in, church, Christian. You're mixed into this world, are you not? You're mixed into this, this communal pen. You're, you're mixed in with the group that maybe are not his sheep. Many of them are not his sheep. But he is the door. The sheepfold as Jesus lays forth this per particular parable, he references the sheepfold. The sheepfold that he references here in verses 1 through 5, he is actually saying that that sheepfold is Israel. Okay? Later, it will reference the world. Later, it's going to be the world. But the sheepfold that he's talking about now, the community pen in which we are mingled in, that's Israel. And we are called out from those things. Notice, no, watch this. Also, the element number four, three, the robber. That's pretty easy to distinguish as Jesus is laying this forth. He, a robber is a false teacher, a Pharisee in this particular circumstance, a Pharisee, the false leaders of Israel, these, these men that would try to dissuade or misguide or mislead the sheep. Satan himself is a deceiver, the robber. And the robber does nothing but break in. What a sneak. He climbs over the wall, climbs down the other side, and he goes mingling through the sheep. And he can't carry those sheep back up over the wall. You know what he has to do? He has to kill it, throw it over the wall, or dismember it and take it piece by piece over the wall. That's what a robber does. Oh, these sheep were valuable. One for wool, two for meat. 
these thieves would break over the wall, come in and try to slaughter and misguide and disrupt the sheep. The fourth element, the shepherd. This is undistinguishable. This is completely able to be discerned. This is Jesus. The reason it is so easy to make discernment is that he says, I am the good shepherd. Now, as I told you I was going to bring this steak before you today, we see the sheep. We have a sheepfold, which is the world or Israel even in this circumstance. He actually has a community pen. There are many sheep in there. But inside his, that pen, he has his sheep. And he knows them by name. The sheep are literally, check this out. This is cool. I hope you get to make note of this. They are literally the called out ones. The called out ones. One, we know that they hear his voice. Two, we know that the, he calls them by name. Three, we know that he knows them. They are the called out ones. Do you know what that word is in the Greek? I've made mention of this on Wednesday nights, and this is a little sales pitch for you to continue to come Wednesday nights because we go deep into the word. Same thing with Sunday nights. Do you know what the called out ones means in the Greek? It's ekklesia. Do you know what that word ekklesia means, the called out ones? Church. Church. Church is the ecclesia. The church is the called out ones. His sheep. Ecclesia, the called out ones. Ecclesia, church. That's what the word church is. Now, the porter. There's been much wrestling about who's the porter. Uh, some men have said that this is John the Baptist, that he was the forerunner of the gospel, the last of the Old Testament prophets. Some have said that the porter, and I tend to believe, I tend to take this passage of scripture to mean that the porter, the one who opens the door, the one who allows sheep to come in and out, I believe that that's God the Father. That's how I interpret that passage of scripture. Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but I am going to, to give a little bit of evidence that I believe that this is God the Father because he runs the show. This is, this is according to God's plan. He knows all things. He is omniscient, omnipresent. Uh, he, he's just... God the Father makes the most sense to be the porter. Strangers, these are false teachers and prophets. This brings us to point number two of this sermon. His sheep have peace through the door. His sheep have peace through the door. And this is verses 7 through 9. Verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me if any man enter in. And friends, this is the, this is the voice of Jesus calling to you today in verse 9. He is the door. He says, I am the door. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Isn't that a wonderful, peaceful word, series of words there? You, this, this gives great assurance to the church. To the believer. For those of you who have lost loved ones and you've questioned, I just don't know if they were saved. For those of you that carry that burden, can I please offer you this assurance? God knows them that are his. And when you say, I don't know if grandma was saved. I don't know if my son was saved. I don't know. You can rest assured in that our God is just. And if that individual was his, he knows his sheep by name. He called them, and they came to him. At one point or another, you can put away all of these open voids in the history with these individuals and rest assured, have peace in God, that if his sheep will hear his voice and they will come to him, there's the stake. There's the meat. There's, there's what makes many angry. God will call his sheep by name. He knows them, and they will come to him. They will. We find peace in the door. Jesus paints this beautiful picture. He paints the, the meaning. He gives us the meaning. He says, I am the door. This is, by the way, the third I am statement that Jesus is, is giving to us in the Gospel of John, the third of seven Seven I am statements. And actually, 
Jesus affirmed the prophets. In verse number 8, he's not saying that all that came before me were thieves and robbers. He's not saying that the Old Testament prophets were thieves and robbers. He actually affirmed the Old Testament prophets. And he actually says that any of these false teachers that stand here before you, these Pharisees, these individuals who lead astray, they are the thieves and robbers. We find that there's peace alone in what Jesus says. These words, his voice, we have peace of God, peace of God through the door. And, and I want to share this thought with you, okay, this little nugget of truth. Our peace is not found, as in verse 9 says, that he shall go in and out and find pasture. Our peace, this is the, this is the quote now, our peace is not found in the pasture, but in the shepherd. Some of us, many of us, we get caught up with the comforts of this life. We find peace in what we have. We find peace in our bank account. We find peace in our home. We find peace in our family. We find peace in the pasture. God is saying, don't find peace in the pasture, in the comforts, in the food, in this life. Have the peace that is in the shepherd. A pasture is only peaceful because of the shepherd who's watching it. And here's why. David was a shepherd king, right? Was he not? David was a shepherd king. David was, he killed a lion with his bare hands, right? He killed them defending his father's sheep. Jesus stands guard over his sheep. The pasture is peaceful because of the shepherd who's watching it. Your life has peace because of the shepherd who's watching it. You can have rest because the king of kings and Lord of Lords has called you out by name. He has placed you in the pasture, which is the reading of feeding of the, on the word of God. And you have peace in this life, no matter the circumstance, no matter the trial, because of the shepherd, because of the door. Which brings me to the third point. The third point this morning is his sheep have protection. His, his sheep have protection in the good shepherd. And this is verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The only thing that really threatens your life is whenever you are not protected. Things that are outside of our control. Drunk driver. Out of our control. Someone runs a red light. Out of our control. Those are things that, that happen in this life. Cancer. Out of our control. Sickness. Out of our control. But it's not out of the control of God. It is, it is never outside of the control of the sovereign God. Things that come into this life are there that we may have our faith strengthened, our trust in him strengthened, and that we may lean upon Jesus. On Wednesday evening, we showed a little clip of Joni Erickson Tata, okay? Joni Erickson Tata is a, is a, is a quadriplegic. She, was, she had her neck broke when she was a teenager, spent 50 years plus in a wheelchair as a quadriplegic, and she said she has great chronic pain, great chronic pain, and she spent through her life unable to use her hands, and, but she is a faithful weapon of the Word of God for the, for the kingdom. She said... When these great series of pain come over her life, she's like, these are like splashovers of hell. She says that these splashovers of hell come into our lives, and she says, what do you think splashovers of heaven are like? And this is what she said. A splashover of hell, i.e. cancer, chronic pain, arthritis, drunk driver, those splashovers of hell are there allowed in your life by God that you may exalt and see what splashovers of heaven are like. The splashovers of heaven are finding Jesus in your hell, seeing, being surrounded by darkness and seeing his light. There's not a, a more glorious notion to be surrounded by the darkness of this life and then see the shepherd. And he says, I'm watching you. Don't worry. I've got this. Follow me. 
hear my voice. What a beautiful idea we have here in John chapter 10. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I will bring you through your pain. <clears throat> in all the Bible, even men and women who have spent their entire lives as unbelievers have heard of Psalm 23. John chapter 10 and Psalm 22, 23, and 22 is a beautiful psalm, Psalm 23 and John chapter 10 are coupled together like cars in a train. Beautiful New Testament truth. Jesus shines light on Psalm 23. And Psalm 20, 23, 750 years before Jesus ever came, more than that, way more than that, almost 2,000 years before Jesus came. We have, we, uh, excuse me, I'm calculating that wrong. It's about 1,100 years, give or take. David wrote Psalm 23. This is Psalm 20, 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Did you see the personal pronouns there for Jesus? He, 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 he leads. He leads my soul. He restoreth my soul. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever because of his voice. He's called you by his word. Provision, abundant life. We must move quickly. We're running out of time. The fifth point that we have this morning, and this is where it gets deep now, friends. Track with me. Track with me here. His sheep receive propitiation through the good shepherd. What is that word? I have to prove to you that, that this is not just a word that Deacon, Deacon came up with. This is a Bible word. This Bible word means atonement, and it's found in Romans chapter 3, verse 29. And I do want to show this to you, so if you do uh, turn there with me, Romans chapter 3, verse 29. Uh, 25, verse 25, excuse me. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. And we know Romans chapter 3. I mean, that's the beautiful chapter that says, listen, there is, as it is written, there is an unrighteous in verse 10. And then we see for verse 23 of Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There we find original sin. There we find that we're not able to come to God of our own accord. And in verse 25, we read, whom God, talking about Jesus, whom God, Jesus, has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So there is the word propitiation. What is that word? That word is, is very similar and almost directly in the same meaning to the word atonement. Jesus through his blood, on the cross, through his blood, became a propitiation, a payment, a reconciliation, an atonement for sin. So very important that you grasp that. Jesus knows his sheep. Now, when Jesus says, listen, in verse number, uh, verse, verse number 11, we'll get down to verse 14. Verse number 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, that's easy to discern. Somebody that's just in it for the money. That's a false teacher that's only there to fleece the flock. The world's full of them. In fact, I think there's more false teachers than there are true teachers. A hireling, they're in it for the money. They're in it for the paycheck. And not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not seeth the wolf coming. You can picture this in your mind. It's so very descriptive. Uh, have you ever seen a timber wolf, by the way? Has anyone ever been up north to Alaska or Canada where they've, they have timber wolves? Timber wolves can stand over six feet tall. They're, they're not just puppies. 
You don't keep these in your backyard. These are dogs, these are killing machines. And they are designed to hunt. That's a wolf. And Jesus actually makes the comparison to false teachers being wolves in sheep clothing, clothing a timber wolf that is actually dressed like a sheep. He's got the nice garb on. He looks like a pastor. He even talks like a pastor. But inwardly, he's a ravenous wolf, a hunter, a killer, a destroyer. And he's void of the word. How do you discern that between a wolf, a false teacher, and a true teacher? The one, you go to a church service, okay, and you've been there. I've been there. You go to a church service that is completely void of the word, and you've found yourself a false teacher. When he leaves off the anchorage and he promotes himself or the people in the pew, and he doesn't give you the truth, there's the sign for a false teacher. When he sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep. He runs. He tuck tails. I'm out. And he, he's running across the pasture, and the sheep are like, wow, what kind of shepherd is this? And they run, and they flee, and they scatter. Verse 13, and the hireling fleeth because he's in a hireling. He's in it for the money. He careth not for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. This is more than head knowledge. This is so much more than seeing a picture of Jesus on the wall and say, I know that guy. This is an intimate, loving knowledge. When the Bible uses this particular word for no, he's actually, God is actually telling us that it's like the no that God uses in Genesis whenever he says, Abraham knew his wife, Sarah. Isaac knew his wife, Rebekah. That is the no that he's talking about. What Jesus is saying is, I know my sheep in such a manner that I love them. And we have so distorted, and this has probably just went through your brains right now. That word no does not mean sexual act. We have twisted what love means in this country, in the world. We've twisted what love means. We've, we've re made it so wretched that it's become just a physical act. What God says is that no, like Abraham knew his wife Sarah, and Isaac knew his wife Rebecca, and Jacob knew his wife Rachel, that no is that I would jump in front of a train if it meant saving your life kind of no. It is completely void of physical act. What Jesus is saying here is that I intimately love my sheep. When I go downstairs to the nursery, and it's packed full of little kids. And I walk down there. Do I love them all? Yes, except for the one that's puking on the floor or doing something. I'm just kidding. No, I love them all. <laughs> Lighting fires in the corner, doing crazy things. I, I love them all in a sense that I have a general love for every child in that place. But I would only die for one of them. That's what Jesus is saying. He has a general love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. There's a general love, but then there is a knowing. There is a that is mine. She is my child. He is my son. I died for them. There's that kind of love, and that's what Jesus says. I know my sheep. And not only that, they know him. They know him. When his voice calls to their heart, they say their back could be turned to God. And when they hear his voice, they say, that is my shepherd. And they come to him. That's the love that is found here in John chapter 10. We must move quickly. I have so much more that I want to share with you. We have a propitiation through his blood, the giving of sin. So who did Jesus die for? Surely, now, this is where I pet the cat backwards. For whom did Jesus die? If you say he died, his blood is applied. In a sense, he died for the world so that anyone may come to him. 
through him, through faith in him, anyone may come to him. The gospel call goes to the entire world. But for whom is the blood applied? Because surely you can't say, as a universalist will say, that the blood is applied to every soul. So what you've just said is that men like Adolf Hitler and Saddam Hussein, the blood of Jesus was applied to their account, and yet they're in hell anyway. Or Judas, or Cain, or Herod, or Pilate. You're saying that the blood is applied to their account. That is, that's false. The blood of the perfect sinless blood, if it's applied to a soul, they're saved. That's the magnitude of the power and the efficacy of the blood of Jesus. If that blood is applied to that soul, that individual, there is no way that they can go to hell. That's the power of the blood. This is what they call in, in theology definite atonement. It's not, the blood is not limited in effect. Please track with me here. The, the blood of Jesus is not limited in effect. It is not limited in power. It is not limited in any quality. But it is definite in extent. It is definite in extent. What do I mean by that? It is applied to his sheep. It is applied to his church. Here's a proof text. If you so would like a proof text, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I'll give you two, just so you can put them in your bag and say, well, there it is. Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, verse 28 reads this, and it's not in your notes. You can make a note of it and look back on it later. Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, is talking about an account with the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, and in verse 28, this is what it says. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the, flock of, all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Paul is saying, listen, preacher, listen, teacher, listen, pastor, elder, deacon. You better take heed because of the flock of God, which God hath made you overseers. You better get your mind right. You better stick to the truth. You better preach his word. Take heed. I love how he uses that word flock. The flock of God. Who is the flock of God? But the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Who did he purchase? Who did Jesus purchase? Jesus purchased with his blood the church. It's right there. It's in John chapter 10. His sheep know his voice. It's in Acts chapter 20. It's in Ephesians chapter 5. And for the sake of time, we are not going there. That's the beautiful husband, bride passage. There's scripture everywhere. So what do we do with John 3.16? That says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We take that verse and we interpret it in light of the context. And the context bubble goes as far as John chapter 10. And if John chapter 10 tells us that I know my sheep, then we must qualify world to mean Jew and Gentile, anybody that comes to Jesus through faith in the blood of him and him alone. How do you get to heaven? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, by the word of God, his voice alone, to the glory of God alone. There is so much depth and richness here in John chapter 10, so much more than Jesus is the good shepherd. This is so much more. He giveth his life for the sheep. Now, bear with me. I know that I've had you seated for a while, and I know these pews are hard. Thank goodness some of you have cushions. We're a couple more minutes here. Bear with me. Verse 15. This is an effectual atonement. This is a definite atonement. We see that Jesus gave his life for the sheep. So this brings me, his sheep hear his voice, and I know them. Verse number 15, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. He's talking about the world now, not just Israel. He's talking, I have other sheep outside of this fold. How's he going to bring them? He's going to call them by the preaching of the gospel. Other sheep I have of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my father love me, because I 
lay down my life that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Now, anybody can do that. Anybody in this room has the power to lay down their life. You can do that. You can lay your, the, your life down, but something that you can't do is take it back up again. Only one can do that. And Jesus says, not only do I have the power, the authority to lay my life down, I have the power to take it again, to raise it from the dead. There's your justification. There's the cherry on top of the gospel. There's the final call of the gospel call. This commandment have I received of my Father. What is he talking about? He's saying that this commandment is that God has ordained from the foundation of the world that he should redeem his elect upon the cross. And that that commandment is actually that Jesus would go to the cross and pay for sins definitely. What does this mean for us? This means that you cannot lose your salvation. This gives you assurance of your salvation. One, he knows his sheep. Two, he calls you. Three, if you look at verse number, if you don't take, don't take my word for it. Look for the word of God. John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my, my hand. You cannot lose your salvation. If you are saved, if you have come through the door, you have heard the voice of the good shepherd, you cannot lose your salvation. Does that mean that we shall sin, that grace may abound? God forbid, Romans chapter 6. Now I've gone over, and I want to share with you one last thing, okay? Can you hear me okay? Brother Kurt has no idea what he just did this morning in sharing with you that, that beautiful little testimony that he gave. If I could take each of you by the shirt and say, please, please, wake up. We are so blessed in this land. We have four and five Bibles in every home. I want you to see what it looks like to hear his voice. Again, I want you to see what we're going to do here in a minute is Tina is getting situated to show a, a one minute clip of believers in China. No Bibles. They do not have Bibles. I want you to see what takes place whenever a, a suitcase of Bibles comes into the midst of these believers. I want you to see what it looks like to hear his voice. Tina, if you're ready, play that clip. you read what she said this is what we needed the most more than anything in this world this is what we needed the most when was the last time you took up your Bible and you said thank you for letting me hear your voice now, I don't usually do this, but I want to call each and every one of you in this place to commit with me to take the flag of this gospel truth and plant it here in Bedford. I want to take this hill for Christ. I want people to come to the saving knowledge 
that Jesus Christ is the good shepherd and he gives his life for his sheep. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so unworthy of your spirit and your word and your voice. We don't deserve to even breathe and yet you are long-suffering and you shower grace and you rain mercy upon the just and the unjust. Father, renew our hearts in this place for you. May we cry out to you this day. Father, I pray that you would start to fill every place in this area, in this state, in this land, that we would see a great new awakening in your spirit, Father, that people would come to your son as they hear his voice. We love you this day. We are so thankful for your sacrifice, for your definite atonement for our sins. I love you, Jesus. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.